Well, good evening. Listening to Stephen Lee, that beautiful prayer just brings to my mind the, the wonderful years that I spent here. He and his brother Danny and I were contemporaries, and we were all members here at, at Southside when Janice and I were here in the training program. And to see uh, them continuing to walk with the Lord is such an encouragement to me. I'm reminded all of this week of how little time there is to reminisce and to, to talk about all the things that have been going on in your life and in my life and the years that have passed since we lived among you. Um, and it just makes me long for the day when we will have unhurried conversations and speak of how the Lord brought us through our darkest and deepest valleys and brought us at home to home to the Father's house at last. And that's where we're headed. And I hope tonight that I can be a little part of helping someone along that way. Well, this is a picture of me and my daughter taken in 1996 just down the road in Nederland, Texas, when we were working there not long after we had left here, a few years after we had left here in the training program at, at Southside. And I, I put this up because she sent this picture to me. Olivia is my daughter, and she sent this picture to me just on Sunday, on Father's Day, and just sent it and said, I love you, Dad. And uh, it was a picture that she apparently had in her possession that she thought a lot of and wanted to send that my way and encourage me. And uh, any, any father will tell you that their daughters are, are special to them. I have three sons, and I love them dearly, and they all live nearby. As young men, we are now able to go out and enjoy things that we all have in common. We like to hunt, and we like to fish, and we like we like to hike and, and ride bikes, and we are able to do those things together, and it's, it's a great thing to have sons that you can share those kinds of, of things with. But daughters, I only have one, and she's special. And there isn't anything that I thought that she needed that I wouldn't do everything within my power to try to help her with. And I think that that provides a good opening for the passage that we're going to be looking at tonight, where we're told in Luke chapter 8, and beginning in verse 41, that as Jesus is making his way along, that a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, man of stature, position, authority, power, came and fell at Jesus' feet an unlikely place for a man of, man of prominence and position. But he's falling at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. And as Jesus went, the people pressed around him. You know, it doesn't matter who you are, you can find yourself in a desperate situation. You, you can be the CEO of your company, and it can be doing very, very well. But if there's trouble at home, if there's something wrong with one of the people that you love, if you have a daughter who is sick and ready to die, if your marriage is coming apart, or if there's something uh, of that nature going on in your life, it, it doesn't matter how high you've, you've arrived in the pyramid of hierarchies of, of which you are a part in society, if your world in this respect is coming unwound, you find yourself in a desperate place. And that's where Jairus finds himself and throws himself at the feet of Jesus, believing that the things that he has heard about this teacher may indicate that there's something he can do about his daughter. And so in verse 43, it's sort of interesting that that story just all of a sudden gets broadsided. It just gets interrupted and derailed. I'm not sure that there's any other story like this in the, in the Gospels about the things that Jesus uh, interacted with among the people. But as he's on his way to Jairus' house to heal his daughter who is sick and about to die, that then there was a woman. Now, we know Jairus' name. We don't know her name. Just a woman 
who had a discharge of blood. She had an issue of blood, as the King James says. Don't you hate it when people know you by your problems? When you're just identified not as Jairus or by even your status or position, the synagogue leader, the man on top, but the woman with the problem. And you can go to the other Gospels, which also tell us about this same story, Matthew and Mark, and they also don't tell us her name. She didn't have status. In fact, as we go on reading, she had been in this situation for 12 years. That's long enough to cause anyone to just about lose all hope. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she had gone to every doctor that you can imagine and spent everything that she had, all of her life savings, all of her resources had been expended trying to find healing for her broken body. And many of us in this audience may know exactly what that experience is like. And, and you've been in the situation that you're in long enough to know that no insurance company wants you. Maybe nobody wants to hire you, and you're known as the broken person, the person with issues, who is penniless, powerless, and could not be healed by anyone. And her condition is, it's uncomfortable for me to talk about, it's uncomfortable for you to hear, but for her, it was far more than uncomfortable. It was miserable. And for a Jewish woman in particular, because of the various holiness codes and law uh, associated with the law of Moses, it was not only a, fish, a physical situation, but also a social situation, a spiritual and religious situation, and a psychological situation for her. Leviticus, the 15th chapter, in verses 25 through 33, really the whole chapter, but those verses in particular specifically address a woman with her kind of situation. And it makes it very clear that not only is she considered ceremonially unclean because of this situation, but also is anything or anyone that she comes in contact with. And so she is not only poor, powerless, penniless, she's also finding herself perhaps increasingly isolated because of her condition. And so in verse 44, it's not surprising that it says that she came up from behind. She didn't do like Jairus did and come out and, and wave Jesus down, announce himself, or have someone announce him to Jesus as here is Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. But she comes up from behind, hoping perhaps that no one will notice her. Maybe you came here tonight with your head bowed down and hoping that nobody would notice you. And so she does this. She comes up upon Jesus from behind and she touched the edge of his cloak. She doesn't want to be having any attention drawn to her. Not with her story, not with her situation. It's too embarrassing. It's, it's too dangerous because, again, of the the holiness codes that the law of Moses addressed. And so she sneaks up behind, she comes from behind and, and reaches out and touches Jesus. And in her secrecy, I think we learned some lessons that the uh, AA has a statement in their big book, I believe, that says, you are as sick as your secrets. We are as sick as our secrets. And a lot of time that's true. There's things that are going on within us that maybe other people don't even know about. Problems that we have, difficulties, issues, something that maybe as a result of nothing that we have been responsible for causing. Maybe it's something that was done to us. Or maybe it's sometimes something that we are responsible for. But whatever the reason is, there's some embarrassment, there's some shame associated with that. There's some weakness associated with that that we don't want people to know about, and so we remain as sick as our secrets because we're not sharing this with anybody. And so as a consequence of that, the places in our life that most need healing 
are often the same places that we don't want anyone to know about. Sort of reminds me, this woman does, of another woman in John's gospel, of the woman at the well, one of my favorite stories. And Jesus begins to have an exchange with her and is gradually revealing himself to her and she perceives that he's a, he's a, he's a prophet. And that as Jesus begins to move into some areas of her life that are deeply personal and highly embarrassing and particularly in a conversation with a holy teacher like Jesus, he begins to talk to her about her issues with men. And I find it interesting that she immediately wants to change the subject. <laughs> what about a religious debate? Let's, let's not talk about my personal life. Let's ask, where's the right place to go to church? You Jews say it's over there at the temple in Jerusalem, but we, we uh, Samaritans think it's over, over here closer to home. What, what, what's the truth about that issue over there? We, want, we don't want the light to be shine in our direction and expose our hidden thoughts and problems and issues. So she thought, I can just, and Matthew makes this clear, she thought, she said to herself, if, if I can just come up from behind and touch the edge of his cloak, I might be healed. I want to take just a moment to do a little bit of a side step here because it is relevant to the story and I think it's fascinating and it has to do with the significance of the fringe or the corner of the cloak. She came up from behind and she touched the corner, the fringe, the edge of his, of his garment. From the research that I've done about this, the, the reference is most likely to what you've probably seen or Jewish men wear, it's, it's a prayer shawl of sorts. It's their outermost cloak. And on the edges of that, there are these blue tassels or fringes that, that hang down. And this cloak is sometimes referred to as wings, and that's probably because when they lift up their hands to pray, it almost gives the appearance of, of wings. In Numbers, the 15th chapter, in verses 38 through 40, we're told that this was something that the Jewish men were supposed to wear. And so I was assume, assume that Jesus had such a cloak as this. And it says throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners. And this is the same word that is used here in, in Luke to refer to the edge of his garment that she reached forward to touch. And on those corners, on the edges of these garments were to be these blue cords or tassels woven in. And it says that the reason for that is that you will have these tassels to, to look at, and when you look upon them, you'll remember something. You'll remember to obey my commands, and you will be holy to your God. So this reminds them of God's law, reminds them of who they are, and to be holy and separate in God's sight. And so as I think about those things dangling down from the side of Jesus and her reaching up to touch the corner of his garment, maybe this very object that represents the obedience to the law and the holiness of a Jewish person. And it's described again as the wings of this garment, as the wings that would hang from the, from the side. I, I've, I've thought, and I don't know that there's anything to this, but I've thought of the passage in the book of Malachi in chapter 4 and verse 2, one of the final words that God spoke through the prophets before the silent period between the old and the new covenants that said, but you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. And maybe she had thought about that passage and saw him passing by and thought, I can come up from behind and I can reach out and I can touch the edge of his garment where these tassels hang down and, and there will be healing in the wings of this great miracle worker and rabbi and teacher and I'll be made whole and no one will even have to know about it. My issues will be resolved. 
Well, whatever the case of that may have been, we know that when she made contact with the corner of his garment that she immediately found the healing that she was hoping for. Her bleeding stopped. And so far, so good. I mean, that's, that's good news. Here was someone who was desperate and who sought healing from Jesus in a rather unusual way, and yet immediately when she follows through on her, her de- determination, finds the results she was seeking. But then everything changes. And Jesus stopped, and one of the gospels says that he even turned about. He was looking around. He, everything, remember, is, is rushing toward Jairus' house where there is an imminent death. And there's an urgency to get there, and he's moving along, but suddenly Jesus just stops. And he's looking around, and he asks the question, who touched me? And when they all denied it, everybody said, it wasn't me, nobody, nobody's, nobody touched you. But then Peter said, well, actually, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. Everybody's touching you. What do you mean somebody touched me? And Jesus said, no, who touched me? Someone touched me. And their touch was different than the rest. This wasn't the touch of the casually interested. This wasn't the touch of the curious. This was the touch of the desperate. Desperate enough enough to draw on the healing power that I possess. And I perceive that it has gone out of me. He knows the difference between the touch of the curious and the touch of the desperate. And so in verse 47, as Jesus is standing there asking this question, who touched me? And he's not moving forward until he gets an answer that the woman saw that she was not hidden. Things had gone well in terms of her being able to sneak up behind Jesus, touch the edge of his garment, receive the healing, but the part of her sneaking away was not going so well. So she came trembling. She was very afraid. I don't know what all might be involved in this trembling, maybe just the nervousness of having all eyes upon her or maybe what she had done with Jesus would be something he wouldn't be pleased about or maybe she's thinking of the story of Uzzah and the ark. If Jesus is the true tabernacle, that that whole symbolic furnishings of the tabernacle and the, uh, uh, and the Ark of the Covenant and all that was only a mere shadow pointing toward how much more dangerous would it be for her in her unclean state to reach out and touch the very essence of that garment that represented the holiness and obedience to the law. Maybe she has forfeit her life seeking her health and healing. So trembling, she falls down before him and declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. One of the other accounts says she told him the whole truth. Um, I hope I don't get in trouble for this, but, you know, women, they'll do that. <laughs> My brother and I will have conversations on the phone. We'll talk for a little while and hang up. And my wife, if she's in the room and knows that we were talking, says, what did Doug say? And I'll say, oh, he's fine. You know, nobody's dead. Uh, We're good. And if she's talking to her sisters on the phone and gets off, whether I ask it or not, I'm going to get the play by play. She said, and then they did, and then they went over here, and then this happened, and that happened, and they, you know, I get the whole truth. And now what's interesting about that is, again, remember the whole larger context. We're in a hurry. We are in a race against the clock. Jairus' daughter is on death's door. And Jesus is talking to a nobody that had some private female problems and she's taking up all the time telling him the whole truth and 
all the story of how this had come about and why she did it and what had been the result. It just asks, begs me to ask the big question, why did Jesus take the time to do this? I mean, he's already healed her. Why not just let her go on her way and hurry on to Jairus' house? Because Jairus has a daughter, and Jairus is desperate too. But then Jesus says this, which I think is the key to the whole passage. In verse 48, he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. This is the only time in the New Testament where Jesus calls a woman daughter. I know Jairus has a daughter, Peter, who's trying to hurry things along, trying to get us to the big man's house so we can sort of level up the profile of our ministry, but Jesus says, Jairus has a daughter, and I'm going to go there and to give the story away a little bit. When I get there, she's going to have already passed away, but I'm going to say some of the sweetest words in the Bible, which I all of a sudden cannot remember. <laughs> what is it? Talitha Kumi, little girl, get up, sweetheart. Get up and present her back to Jairus and her family. But right now, in this moment, here's someone else that I care about. Daughter. I need to stop long enough and listen to her long enough to know that she's not the woman with the issue. Your Bible probably says something like that, either on the heading or the margin, the woman with the issue of blood. That's what I always seem to think of when I refer to this story. It's the woman with the issue. She's not the woman with the issue. She's a daughter of the king. And Jesus is not going to let her sneak away with a healing that she feels like she stole because she didn't really deserve it, but she cheated the system and somehow got what she wanted. But really, on the truest part of her inside is no different than she was before. She's an heiress. And the healing that she has just received is nothing but an earnest. It's no, nothing more than a down payment on the inheritance that I have for her. Everything the Father has and everything that I'm dying to purchase is hers. And she's mine. She is a daughter of the King. But how can this be? We still haven't really resolved this underlying tension, have we, of this issue of, of the holiness passing by and her reaching out and touching that in an unclean state. Isn't this the problem of the, of the unholy defiling the holy? It's a question that we see in so many of the stories in the New Testament where Jesus encounters lepers Dead bodies, again, in this story, when he gets to Jairus' house and the little girl is already passed, he touches her. And for the longest, I would just say, well, you know, it was like in the Old Testament, the holiness was sort of fragile and insecure, and it could sort of like easily be touched and contaminated by the unholy, and the unholy would spread to the holy, and, and we couldn't have that, so you had to have extra precautions to keep these barriers. But Jesus' holiness was so powerful that, it, that when it came into contact with the defiled, that instead of him becoming defiled, his holiness just overwhelmed and spread out. And, and there's something to that. But there's something deeper as well. I believe that he was exchanging in some profound sense his holiness for her defilement. 
It seems to me that Jesus is going through the world and he is absorbing all of the sin, the sorrow, and the shame of this broken, sin-cursed world. And the fact of the matter is that Jesus could do this and she could live to tell about it because she could stop bleeding and re-enter the community because he would soon bleed freely and be expelled from the community, become the ultimate exile and outcast on Golgotha's hill, which we just heard such a powerful presentation about. And so what's the application and conclusion for us tonight? Well, I want to end by reading to you from Hebrews, the 10th chapter. In verse 19, the Hebrew writer talking about how the new covenant is so much greater than the old because of the greatness of of Christ and his superior sacrifice for sin. It says in verse 19, therefore, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, we can go to the holy places. She touched the holy place with her defiled hand, was able to do so without paying the price of her life because Jesus gave his life for her. We can enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us, as his children, draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, And our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast. Let us reach out and touch. Let us hold fast the confidence and the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Is there anyone here tonight? There's hundreds of people here tonight. And some of you are curious and some of you are interested and some of you, your life is going well and that's, that's great, that's good. But is there anyone here tonight who's desperate? Is there anyone here tonight who came with their head hung low hoping to sneak out without being noticed? Why do that when you can leave here with your head held high because you are a child of the king. You are his daughter. You are his son. You are not the woman with the issue. You're not the man with the problems. You're an heir of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And everything that he has, everything that he died is yours. If you'll come tonight, in desperation and throw yourself at the feet of Jesus, he will not turn you away. How irresistible to his grace is failure when it comes humbly seeking his favor. If we can help you in that regard in any way, please let us know while we stand and while we sing.